I'm going to start the chat with BJ a little differently than I do most of the other chats because of his significance to this situation. About two years ago, I was contacting everybody and their dog about trying to bring these chats to Australia. And, you know, someone would say, well, contact this person, that person, someone else. And it was mostly, well, gee, I don't know. And I don't know anything about that. Well, finally, I get through this whole loop of people and I come to BJ. And I, we got on, it was either FaceTime or Skype. He listens to what I had to say and then said, you know, I, I do know someone that might be uh, worth meeting. And he introduced me to Renee Lee. Here we are. <laughs> so technically, I owe you a gigantic thank you. Oh, no. Look, thank for you for coming down. Enabling these chats to be happening Look, here. I could probably say that this is as far south in the world as you will travel to do these types of interviews. <laughs> um, unless you, I don't know, is there anything going on in Antarctica? At the murder station? <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty, be pretty lonely there, I think. Yeah. Who knows? You know, there are folks yeah. all over the world. Who knows what's, what's there? So we're going to start again right at the beginning. Please tell us a little bit about your growing up because you used a phrase I didn't know when you told me about that, and that was 10 pound palms. Yes. <laughs> Ex would you explain that for the international audience, please? Okay, so palm is a, is a term that's, that's used by a lot of Australians to, um, it actually comes from pomegranate. Well, some people say it comes from pomegranate, which is a term for British immigrants. Um, and some say it's because of Australian slang pomegranate immigrant. I don't know how that really works, but they say it's kind of a rhyming slang type of thing. And other people say it's because the British were so white when they came over here, they turned the colour of pomegranates because of our uh, sun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the 10 pound, um, that comes from, you know, basically how much it, it costs to come over here um, to, to immigrate to Australia in, in the 60s and 70s in particular. Um, so my mother and father basically paid a, um, a tenner and my brothers and sisters, they, they came for free. And it, was, okay. it was pretty pretty good deal these time you know these days a lot of people want to come to Australia um, to immigrate and it's a lot harder than that of course and um, look it was the best move that they ever made to be honest and th they feel the same I think there was at one point where they missed the miss the old country as they, they would say and then they went back and then they're like oh what did we do you know <laughs> and it was very hard to come back again um, but then uh, you know they had my older, my older um, brother and two older sisters. In, in, in they were all from East London, which is around East Ham. Okay. Um, and so I think when they came to Australia, I thought I guess that they were kind of almost thought they were done having kids. But then they came to Australia. And thought, These are good breeding grounds. Uh -huh. <laughs> Lots of sunshine and fresh water, I guess. <laughs> and um, they had another. They popped out another three. You oh know? my gosh! Okay. <laughs> I, and I was okay. one of them. Yeah. And I had another. Uh, yeah, it was another younger brother and an older brother as well. Okay. And um, yeah, so there was six of us. And uh, back in those days, a lot of people who were immigrating to Austra Australia, in particular, um, Melbourne, you would you'd kind of. A lot of a lot of British were moving to Frankston North, um, and also there's a lot of people moving to Perth as well, like on, oh. on the Western Australia as well. There seemed to be a big immigration there. Yeah. Okay. Was that some sort of special uh, program that Australia had to try to bring people here? I'm guessing. Yeah, kind of. There were we actually saw a big influx of um, uh, Greek immigrants and Italian immigrants okay. during that period as well. Um, which is why you see so many, um, you know, there's a lot of people from Greek backgrounds in, in Melbourne. We've got a lot of Greek, a big Greek population here, okay. um, big Italian population as well. But um, yeah, it was, you know, I guess we were, un <laughs> Australia was very underpopulated at that point. And, and it was, all, you know, a lot of it was about building it up. And um, okay. I look, I, I just think we're, it was the best move that my parents ever made, without a doubt. I feel privileged uh, to, to be in Australia, to live in Australia, and, and uh, we're very, very lucky here. Um, and I personally believe bring more immigrants over. <laughs> That's what I seriously believe. I, look, I, I feel like a spoiled brat here sometimes. <laughs> you know, we've got this great, beautiful country that, that's incredible, and I think we should work out ways to, to share it. 
um, with other people who, who are not so fortunate as well. And um, yeah, and, and, and embrace them. Like I guess people embraced my, my family when they first came over as well. Fantastic. When we were preparing for this chat, you spoke at length about your father and his philosophies. What did he teach you? So one of the, first of all, he taught me how to, to love immensely. And my mother did that too. And I feel like he installed something into me that has carried on to this day into, you know, into my spirit. Um, my, I've got the most in extraordinary parents and most unique parents that you'll ever come across. So my father was a, was a stand-up comedian and, oh. my, and my mother was a clairvoyant. Oh my God. <laughs> so you had a, you a, a pretty unique combination there. Um, and my father, he in particular, and my mother as well, they would make a joke out of everything pretty much during our childhood. And if t times were tough and, you know, we weren't very um, well off, financially, um, but they would make, you know, everything would turn to a joke, you know, sometimes okay. it would be dark humour as well, um, but every, like, you know, yeah, everything would be about humour and making sure that we had a good time, and you could never be really sad in that house, and like, I, I had the father and the mother that was off, I guess, of fairy tales, really, a lot of children would come and come over to my house, and they'd say, I want, you, I want your dad to be my dad, oh. <laughs> you know, because um, he was just like, he, he, you know, he, he was just incredible. Like, and he still is to this day, um, incredibly supportive. And one of the, the philosophies that he really installed into me was that to find something that you enjoy doing and try and make a, a living out of it, you know. Mm. Um, and that happened to be sex, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that was intended. But it, it just so happens to be that. And, <laughs> and he sees how my life has turned out. And it, but for, him, for him, it's like it didn't matter what I was doing as long as I was happy. And for all of his children, it, it was all about them being happy first and foremost. Oh, great. There was never any pressure on us to do anything that he wanted. I feel like if you try and... I feel like if you try and have children to emulate yourself um, or to progress yourself by emulating yourself, maybe that's part of a, a human trait that we try and do as humans to try and evolve the, the species. But it's brutal. You know, yeah. we can't do that to our children. That's just a, a, it might, maybe that is natu natural or something that us, we, we do. But it's, it's not fair. You know, we should be focusing on making sure that our, you know, our children are happy. And whatever they do makes them happy. And I am so lucky that, he, he, you know, he's both my mother and my father have um, blessed me with a happy spirit and that they've blessed me with, I guess, their blessing of, of working in the adult industry um, from you know, a pretty early age as well. They never tried to veer me from it, not once. You married very young. Yes, why I why did. did you do that? Yeah, um, so I fell in love. <laughs> madly yeah, I was madly in love um, like I met my wife uh, at the time when I was about 16 okay and so just around about the high school age uh, at, I always wanted a, like a, a girlfriend I can remember being a child and, and riding around on my bike by myself and pretending that I had a girl that I was, I was, I was dinking oh, on my bike. Oh. Well, dinking means, um, how would you say it? Sitting on the handlebar. Now oh. that sounds worse, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on the handlebar. Okay. Um, oh, I don't know how to explain this one. <laughs> sitting on the, sitting, what, riding, like, basically, I don't know. <laughs> Let's just say dinking. <laughs> and... I was. I always wanted to share experiences with somebody and okay. go through life. Even though I had, look, I was. I had a very close relationship with with my my brothers. Like we all shared a bedroom, um, and I've always lived in houses full of people as well. So I've always, yeah. I've, I've, and we moved out together pretty young. I think I was about seventeen when I moved out. Wow. With her. Yeah. We young. were. We were like pretty much wanting to get married after about eight weeks. Um, and yeah, as soon as we met, like it was, 
we just couldn't get out of the bedroom. <laughs> we, we really were. Um, we were always in the bedroom. And at, at the, I think my parents got a little bit upset because I was always in there. And take, I think it was like, and the phone would ring or something and they'd be knocking and yeah. I, <laughs> but, you know, but then we started with all that time, you know, it was, I guess, to go, go, go back a little bit, I had an obsession with 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 uh, like really high impact sports oh. from an early age. Like I was I was doing freestyle wrestling. I was doing boxing training. I was playing rugby league, um, all at once. You know, mm. and I had this enthusiasm. I had like this like this um, massive energy all the time that I could never unleash. And I loved things to do with adrenaline. Like I even loved horror movies, you know, and everything. And then when I guess when when I met my first love um, and we had this connection then I discovered that sex was like some type of fulfillment it was like the next level and I gave I pretty much gave up on sport after that <laughs> well, there you go. that was my new sport and and we, we tried to experiment with so many different scenarios and we started you know I guess a few years later we like in you know our, our teens uh, well, we're still in our teens, and at about 18, I think we, we started talking about um, having group sex. And then we, I can remember the first time we, we, we made an attempt to hook up with other couples. We put an um, ad up in, an, in a local adult shop. And it was, the, back then it was kind of, I guess it was pre-internet. So you'd, you'd get a piece of paper and cut it out and write your message on there. Oh. And I, I think that most people did, probably didn't believe it back then because we <laughs> you know, it was two 18 year olds looking for this. But how um, did you, at, at that age, that's a very young age to be exploring that kind of thing. I, what brought you to that? I, so I, I did have a little bit of a fascination with sex, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from, yeah, from, I was exposed to you know, not not by my own choice. I was exposed to pornography at a pretty young age. I guess there is that. You know, How I so. I say the first time I watched pornography, um, it was at a, my my friend's house, and his dad was a, was a, a truck driver. So he'd go away for times <laughs> at a time, oh, okay. and we would raid his bin, which was under his clothing. It was, he did a terrible job of hiding his porn. Like it was awful, um, and so we would get all types of. Um, porn out of there and he had a lot of bisexual porn as well which was quite interesting so that was the first time I actually saw um, you know two guys having sex as well um, <laughs> a lot of it was golden shower porn um, so the first it was actually the very first porn I ever watched was actually golden shower porn oh. um, and so I was fascinated by that I was absolutely fascinated I was look, watching people drinking you know each other's urine and I thought why are they doing that you know and that kind of sparked some curiosity <laughs> Then it progressed to, you know, once, once I didn't really see that friend so much anymore. Oh, this sounds really tragic, but you'll have to forgive me. I was young and I would go through recyc big, big recycle bins and I would actually jump in and go for looking for porn max. Because <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I was so fascinated. I wanted to see more. I just wanted to see more. I was like thinking, why are these people doing, it, doing these things to each other? And I actually remember I went to a I went to a um a primary school called Frankston Primary, and across directly across the road from this primary school, there was an adult shop. Oh. A and this adult shop used to have these kind of almost like Western saloon doors on it that swing <laughs> open and swing <laughs> close. And I would go I'd be babysat by my by my sister after school quite often and. Um, sometimes when I was walking there, I'd try and peek under, oh. and, and, and in my immature mind, I thought that there was women stripping in there, and I thought oh, there were people, these people having sex, you know. <laughs> so that's how you discovered sort of the I, I, kink community? No. Uh. <laughs> I guess that's what I thought the kink community would have been, but yeah. <laughs> but so, sorry for, for going back a little bit further there. Um, let's fast forward again. <laughs> um, so around about 18, I really knew that sex was 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 seriously for me mm. and i wanted to be around it a lot and i wanted to explore it more and that fascination was like insane you know and now i was actually have you know i was actually having sex on a regular basis <laughs> and where does this go why do our brains do these things um and so i started working in an adult shop like there was actually an adult shop that was right. there was a job advertised yeah and that was um 
and, and I basically went into the interview and I pretty much begged to work there, <laughs> I think. Um, but, and I didn't really have much ex work experience in anything else other than going to working in trade jobs where I just felt like I didn't fit in. Um, you know, my father was a comedian. My mother, as I was saying, was a, was a clairvoyant. I wasn't really brought up, and they were both from East London, where they got the they got you know the tube or the buses. Mm. I didn't know much about cars, so I couldn't become a mechanic. Had no carpentry skills whatsoever. Um, I didn't have much of an interest in trades <laughs> at all, to, like a, a lot of the times. And I didn't really fit in into that mould. Like you know, I went mm. I went and worked at places like that. I lasted about a week, and I didn't feel comfortable with. The, the other men there mm. um it just they just didn't seem like real <laughs> you know there seems to be this macho mentality where it's that that's what i felt a lot and i never felt connected to a lot of people i had trouble getting a, a like a you know retail jobs in general um i guess it was you know a bit different if you were kind of a guy i mean it's completely different now but back then like I, th I think that someone made a joke that with the area where I grew up, if you want to go in camouflage, you go in high vis. You know, uh, <laughs> it was very much a trade area. You know, for, full of tradesmen. Um, but you but said at this at this porn shop uh, that you learned very solid core values. Tell us about that. It was life changing. Um, I don't. Mm. I'm not even sure if I would actually be doing what I'm doing today if I hadn't had worked at that particular adult shop. Mm -hmm. um, this adult shop, it was, in, it was in Mornington off the main street. Um, it was run by the most incredibly amazing woman. Uh, her name was Andrea. I've tried to find her for so many years and I just can't find her because oh. I want to thank her oh. really, really bad. Um, so she was the most beautiful, incredible person. She would actually take care of injured wildlife uh, as well as running this adult shop. Oh, wow. So we would actually have baby kangaroos out the back of this adult shop. Oh, wow. This probably sounds like, yeah, well, it's Australia because you're from America, <laughs> but that's pretty rare, you know? <laughs> um, so you'd have possums and, and you know, these the baby kangaroos. If you've ever seen a bang, baby kangaroo wrapped up in like a baby's rug, in like a baby rug or a blanket, with its big feet poking out, it's the most adorable thing. And I kind of saw myself as one of her injured wildlife a little bit, I guess. You know? That's a strong <laughs> statement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At that stage, because I didn't have a place. Um, I didn't feel like I had a place, really, because I didn't feel like I fitted into that area um, where I was growing up. And so her core values was basically a, a professional environment. Um, and all about being proud to be an adult industry worker. And that's something that I, I, I'm, to this day, that I try and carry on. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't care what I get paid at this job. You know, I'm going to do the absolute best I can possibly do. Well, tell us a little more ab about the shop and, and some of the things you learned there. So one of the things that, um, that in particular, that Andrea would make sure we were selling, with, with the pornography we're selling, um, she would make sure that every single porn cassette that we sold had the ACT classification code on them. So she'd make sure that none of them were pirated. Oh. Um, and that was really important to her, um, mainly because she believed that everybody, every porn that was, was sold, every, every cassette that was sold or, or watched, you know, something should be going to the producers, something should be mm, going to the mm, directors. Mm, 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 mm. And the only way, and, and, and of course the actors, you know, and the only way to have a, a healthy industry was to actually do the right thing. Whereas pretty much all the other adult shops were just pirating yeah. cassettes. Like it was unheard of to actually, and like our, our videos were a lot more expensive, people would complain, but she was all about industry and, yeah. and she really focused in on that. And, um, I'd write a lot of porn reviews. She just let me actually watch porn on shift and then I'd write <laughs> reviews about them to, to be able to share with the other staff. I watched a lot of porn. <laughs> I watched so much porn. It was... I, I, and that's actually where, where I think some of it started. I ended up going 
guess for a point where like you know if I had sex the person would have to have clothes you know uh, <laughs> and that's where you know because I kind of got oh, I'm getting a bit bored of nudity now <laughs> and like I kind of you know developed fetishes for, for, for rubber and different outfits anything with color and you know dressing up and things like that that was that was important um, tell us about some of the people you must have met in this situation that had to be yeah. really amazing so with working in a in a country kind of uh, adult shop, and it was back then, you know, Mornington was <coughs> was like the the country. That that is an eye opener, you know. Um, that you that's where I learned that so many people, like you see one side of people on on the outside walking around, and that everyone is so unique in their sexuality, and we're really complicated like humans are very very complicated beings like mm. we're, we're extremely complex and so can our sex be and so can our sexualities it, like it's incredible such how, as um ooh, just like football players that you know that, that you know that you see them on the weekends playing footy with their mates and you know but you know that they're, they're you know they they're cross dresses you know um, or you know or they'll share some of their fantasies with you. Um, it, that was a bit of a that was an eye opener, especially you know people that were in their you know eighties or nineties that go to their local RSL wearing their RSL pins, which is like a um, kind of a veterans. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like a veteran pin, mm -hmm. and you know what they they'd be interested in you know pornography too they had it they had they had sexual needs as well you know and as a teenager um realizing that everybody had sexual needs that all of us are driven and but most of all the world is not what it seems it, it really isn't and i guess that's you know what what's got me you know experimenting more uh, as well um and i guess with that that's when i started experimenting with both men and women as well um group sex situations. I wanted to try as much as I could. I was like a kid in a candy shop sure. <laughs> in my early 20s, really. But if the world is not what it seems, then what is it? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, what is it? Yeah. I, I think it's, I think there's a, to be honest, and I don't want to sound cynical, there's a whole lot of fakery going on, you know. Um, there's a whole lot of barriers going on. Um, there's a whole lot of need to, to protect um, people's, you know, um, personal lives. Um, just this massive facade, like there, there really is, hmm. you know, it's been you know, over 20 years of the adult industry now. Um, and it's been the most eye-opening experience that I've, 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 I've changed with that. What's hmm. been the most eye-opening? The, the experiences that I've had and the people that I've had to deal with um, in such a positive way as well. You know, how the way, the way people can express themselves um, and how much we've pent down and we've, we've, we've you know, we've, we've people, you know, pen, pen ups, you know, like they really hide so much of their sexualities and don't. Mm. And it's sad because like life is so short and I personally believe you've got one of them, you know, and I know for myself and what made me get out there and experiment a lot more is I don't want to go to the grave thinking, what if, uh -huh. you know, what, what if I would have tried this? What if I w would have done that? You know, and I definitely don't want to go through life wrapped in cotton wool either. So I've, you know, I, I've, I've tried to experiment with as much as I possibly can. Um, I've had lovely relationships and, you know, and some intense relationships but they're all great, they're all human experiences, it's all part of life, and, and I've got no regrets, really. You said you're not conditioned by life's conventions, so w tell us about that, what do you mean? Oh, I, I probably I should have re rephrased that a bit better. I try and not be conditioned. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the, my f basically my philosophy pretty early on was, I'm, I'm trying to live my life without being conditioned by things like I guess religion, um, what the status quo is with, with a lot of other, you know, with what we've been taught from mm. a young age, from the outside. Uh, have, have I been impressioned by TV, media? What if we, what if we, we didn't have these conditions? So I try and live a life that's, um, I question everything. 
Okay. You know, I question all of my beliefs. Um, I, I think one of the most common questions we, 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 that we should ask in a lot of situations, especially when it comes to having, you know, sexual relationships with other people um, and some decision making is like, am I acting this way out of jealousy or is there an, what kind of emotion is dictating my, my response? Um, how can I look at it, this from a different angle? And one thing that I've trying to do, and this is my ultimate goal, is actually be somebody that first and foremost that I respect myself rather than trying to, I guess, get the respect of others. So in a lot of situations I would go, okay, this is how I feel on this knee jerk reaction right now. But if I could step out of side of myself, then what would I respect in, in a human, in a human mm -hmm. if I was looking at myself? Mm -hmm. And then I try and I take away things like, try to take away things like ego um, and, and greed and things and, and try, and, uh, try my best to, to think with logic and, and be somebody that I would actually personally respect. Um, and, I, you know, it's not always easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's my goal. Rather than looking at what everybody else, like I, what everybody else would respect. And then that's what I think a lot yeah. of people go through life going, um, I just want to be respected by everybody else. And, but I think it's important to, to actually, you know, like really be somebody that you, you, that you believe in and that you can be proud of. You mentioned the Kinsey scale. How does that apply to BDSM? Well, it, it's, it, well, I love the Kinsey scale, especially for, for when it comes to, you know, talking about um, our sexuality where, you know, one, one, one side is complete, you know, I guess is, is being completely homosexual. The other side is completely heterosexual. And, you know, I, I felt like I'm always all, all around that kind of place my whole life. And mm. especially in my early teens, I thought that I was, you know, I, I, I kind of, there's a period there where I thought I was, you know, very more gay than I was heterosexual. Um, and then it sways from this side, this side, this side, and it's been like that my whole life. But I feel like that Kinsey scale, if, if, I, if, if you look at it the same with BDSM, you've got one side which is non-sexual, You've got one side which is sexual, you know, and, and I feel like there's more, there's like so much of our, our body that can be stimulated from BDSM um, rather than just our sexual organs. Mm. You know, our minds can be stimulated. Yeah. Um, and like I, I've been in situations in particular with flogging, like I love flogging and I can be flogging a man over his back and just really drifting off into that and and especially when the, the breathing starts slowing and you can see their chest is you know slowly mm -hmm. rising and closing again and you, you tune in to them yeah and you go on a journey together and i'm not getting a hard on you know there's nothing going on there and i'm just going off into a complete journey with them and this is the thing like so many men that even if they were really far on that Kinsey scale over to heterosexual, if there weren't so many barriers, I feel like they should be able to be comfortable to have those experiences with other men. Sure. And we've been conditioned that we can't share intimate bonding experiences with other men that don't always have to be completely outright sexual or end in sex. And I believe that there should be, you know, a world, ideally there would be great if there was a world where, where men were more comfortable with other men. But yeah. we have to go all the time, you know, and that, that's again where I'm talking about the conditioning as well, where I try and not let yeah. the rest of the world condition me. Um, and I started, you know, so I by that philosophy and, and I've had many incredible experiences with, with men. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like there's so many other things that you could, we, I, I can delve into sometime in the future as well. But, um, you, yeah, do you understand what I'm, what I'm referring I, I to? I do, yeah, yes, yeah. I hope the audience does. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on monogamy? So I've been monogamous, I've been um, in open relationships, I've been polyamorous. Um, so I don't think it's completely natural, <laughs> personally. Um, I, I, I'm not a science scientist, so I can't tell you, tell you specifically. Uh, there's a lot of debate over that. I, I think sometimes it can be fun. Uh, monogamy can be fun. 
I think that uh, open relationships can be can be fun and polyamory. I think it depends on the individuals and and, sure. and, and, and of course the relationship. I think there's unhealthy monogamy where mm. there's like a lot of jealousy involved and there's a lot of control involved and I think that's when it can go a little bit too far. Yeah. I also think that we would be less monogamous if we, we, we weren't so complicated yeah. uh, as humans. We didn't create the five day work week. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're at work all of the time. We don't get to spend a lot of time with our partners. And I think if we could actually live in a world where we didn't work so much and we could spend a lot of time building relationships, I don't think we would see as much monogamy. I actually pers personally, I think that monogamy is also partly created because uh, of the situation they've been thrust upon and probably religion as well and, and yeah. men trying to control women <laughs> well, <laughs> to take, a certain degree. <laughs> take us to Eagle Leathers, which from where we are here in Melbourne is not more than a five minute walk away, really. Mm. Tell us about the shop. How did it evolve? And it's, it's coming up on, a, on an anniversary, isn't 25 it? 25 years. Yes. 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 So I, I started at Eagle Leather um, 15 years ago. And okay. that was, so part of my interest in going there was we used to get the leather, like a newsletter called the Leather Link. And one of the great things about that was I saw that they were doing classes. So they had a whole educational program. And I used to get this sent to the adult shop that I was working at. And it was a, it was a black and white printed newsletter. And I used to see, you know, photos of men dressed in leather and they were running classes on fisting and talking about kind of like spiritual experiences with fisting as well. Um, you know, men doing classes on rope and um, cock pumping. And I used to look at these photos of men all dressed in leather and I could see that you'd sense this brotherhood mm. and it was so fascinating because then I, I you know, I, I wanted to meet these men and I wanted to be around these men uh, in particular. Um, and I also wanted to work for a business, you know, like I knew at that stage I wanted to work in adult retail for the rest of my life. Mm. And seeing that they had an educational program where I could actually learn on top of that and just keep advancing. and with working in an, a regular adult shop, you're kind of limited to yeah. where you can go. I can, I can remember I worked at an adult shop and we were selling a pump called the Handsome Up, which is like a very basic kind of pump. And it was just always flying out the door. And I went to England for a bit and moved over there and then came back to um, Australia, worked at the same adult shop, still a top seller. Oh, Whereas, oh. you know, Eagle Lever in a fetish store, you, 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 know, you, you have something that's very popular and people gobble it up and they're, they're next, on, onto the next thing, you know? So it's always changing, okay. always evolving, yeah. much like my sexuality was. <laughs> and, and my interest was always evolving. And, uh, and it just seemed like, like an unlimited um, you know, opportunity to explore going to Eagle Leather. So I went for an interview with, with Brian Muir, who is the founder of Eagle Leather. He found, founded Eagle Leather in about 1994, and he'd been running classes since about then as well, went very early days. Mm. And he could see my enthusiasm um, straight away during, during the interview. And at that time, I was also doing, you know, I, I did a few party plans as well. And I'd also done a talk for a group called Peninsula Guys in, in, um, on the peninsula, which was a gay group for men living on the peninsula. And he could see that enthusiasm and he straight away wanted to put me on as a staff member and could see potential in me to become a presenter as well, okay. and, and, and eventually. Uh, and he, I can remember, like after the first week, he gave me like $1,500 worth of electric sex equipment. Oh, wow. And said, go home and experiment. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, not many workplaces you go. you'd go to and they'd say, here, here's, here's some sex toys, go home and experiment. <laughs> but he did, and um, yeah, I, I I definitely have gave my electric sex equipment a good <laughs> working out that weekend. <laughs> but you, you have an interesting philosophy about uh, the responsibility of Eagle Leathers mm. to the overall community. And, and I'm going to throw in here that numerous people tell me of the benevolence of, of you and of Eagle Leathers. Talk with us a bit about that. So we're, we're a, a business that is doing you know, reasonably well um, because we have a great support, we have a great community, and I t believe that, you know, when you're, you know, I've, I've, I've been blessed that this community has actually given me a living 
this yeah. community has made my dreams come true. You know, they, they really have. Uh, I don't know what I'd be doing without them. And, I will, and I've made a pact that I will never forget them. And we're a financial business. With this money, we need to put back into the community. Like, I believe that if anybody in the world should be supporting community, it should actually be fetish stores. Because we're making money. The, the, the community comes in, they buy their products. We need to put in, and especially for people like, in particular, ambassadors, you know, what they're doing is they're preaching yeah. the good word of exploration and hedonism. Yes. Uh, you know, that's, that's, and that's really, really important. And I also want to be a part of the evolution of, of this community. And I can just, I just want to say this, this as well. I, I am, I've, I feel you know, honoured that Manhouse is actually got me here today. You know, like I'm actually presenting in a competitor's uh, you know, yeah. store. Yeah. You know, not many places in the world would actually, you know, um, norm that would normally happen so much, you know, but mm -hmm. they've, in the spirit of community, they've let me come on board. That's wonderful. A and, you know, Lucretia and Dessart, we're, we're, we're like co-platinum sponsors for other events as well. Um, like, you know, we, we, we've, you know, but I want to see this city and this country on the map. Mm. Um, and it's part of the reason why I was so eager for you to also come here as well and for us to share our stories um, and to put you in, in touch <laughs> with, with Renee because um, she's also trying, she's on the same page, she's documenting the history yes. here. Yes. And I'm hoping that one day <laughs> We can look back at this and in 2030, this city and this country will truly be on the map. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that Eagle Ever can be a part of that um, and help with that. But it's also a, a major, 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 major mission for our community to mm. actually embrace that and move forward. The only way this country, in my opinion, is ever going to be on the, on the fetish map is if we can do things that most other countries and communities can't do, and that's work together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we yeah. see politics so often, we see yeah. community fighting within the community yeah. uh, all the time, and we should be fighting for our community rather than inside of our community. And that's right. we, humans are complicated again, <laughs> yeah. we know that, and we're always going to have differences. Um, but we try at Eagle Level, we try and be impartial and try to have a diplomatic approach to a lot of things. A and yeah. ho hopefully, you know, we can see um, Melbourne and, you know, the and other c cities as well. Like th there's um, Jerry and Sky in, in Adelaide that, that are putting on events like Geared, mm. which, mm. you know, Adelaide, I didn't really hear of them for all these years. You know, you didn't really see of much what was going on there. And those guys are punching above their weight. They're, they're in a wow. city called the City of Churches, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, with a small population, yeah. and people are travelling from Melbourne and Sydney and Queensland to, to go there. Um, we've also got Scout here tonight from from you know Bootco and Cooper. He's relentless in, in doing good things for the community. Like he he just doesn't seem to stop. <laughs> it, you know, so we have these really, really great ambassadors and people doing good things. And we need to bring it all together. You know, we, we need to do, we, to, to, to be where I'm hoping we will be. Um, we need more of that. We need, and we need businesses to work together too. You took me on a, on a very wonderful tour of Eagle Leather just a couple of days ago when I arrived here. What has all of that work taught you about the Leather Kink tribe? That you know, if you show support, they, they will support you back. Mm. Like, I, there was an experience that we had uh, if, if, if in 2017 where I nearly lost the business, or we nearly lost the business. Oh, wow. Um, and it was due to it, you know, there was, a, there was a proposal to make out the front of our shop a 24-7 clearway um, because, and it was also announced by our state politician, um, it was, it was a state premier, Daniel Andrews. And, you know, it was almost like everyone was saying, look, it's, it's almost a done thing. You know, my family said, we will do everything we can, but you've got to understand that they're going to make this a clear way at the front of your store. 
I wouldn't have been out, they were proposing this, to, uh, you know, basically to do this in a couple of months. So if you're in a commercial lease, you can't move in that time, oh. you know, and you can't, and, and we wouldn't have been able to find a place in, 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 in enough time. It would have really devastated our business. It could have even potentially put us out of business oh. with what they were proposing. Um, they basically wanted to put a big red line down Hoddle Street. So I did, it, the, 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 the biggest thing was that, I won't go deep into it, but the hardest thing is that in Melbourne, everybody knows Hoddle Street as one of the worst roads you can possibly travel down. Like it's bumper to bumper, you know, in people's minds all the time. Uh, and, but we were kind of debating that, you know, at one side of the road at, in the morning, it's bumper to bumper. On the other side, in, in the later afternoon, it's bumper yeah, to bumper the other way. and so forth. But yeah. during the afternoon, it's completely free running traffic. But trying to convince everybody that, yeah. <laughs> that this wasn't a problem because they'd all had bad experiences and everybody thought it was a, almost a joke. If you were outside of the community, thought it was a joke that, you know, the idea that we would, that we would win. Um, but this community signs like, signs like a petition that had our council absolutely gobsmacked. Um, I had politicians calling me and saying, you know, basically saying, can you please tell this customer to get off our back? And, what were they you know, saying to them? What, what was going on Don't take there? Eagle Ever away, you know? Don't mm. destroy the character of our neighbourhood. Because um, we had the Laird behind us as well. We had Piercing HQ, which, which you know, is, is a leather-friendly piercing studio. Uh, we've got this whole area that, you know, taking away all of this parking out the front meant that we, there was no other parking anywhere to go. Everyone would mm. have to move. Mm. And everyone banded together and even the other businesses around our area who were all going to lose their businesses some of them were you know they were having nightmares about this our community saved those businesses wow. you know even these vanilla businesses our community if it wasn't for this community there would be a 24 7 <laughs> clearway there and there would be a lot of bankrupt people um and they kind of changed the landscape of melbourne i guess <laughs> And they they helped they helped me and I will never forget that like I, I yeah f forever I I when we when we just when they announced that they were going to back down on the decision I cried um, and when you know more calls came in from politicians trying to tell me that please please know that I'll you know I'm on your side they weren't on my side originally uh, it's uh, just that yeah. they got bombarded so much <laughs> what is what is the best um, selling things that you have in the shop <clears throat> crisco <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> So if you need to do any baking, you I know where to known. get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite incredible because we have a lot of people who come from, uh, from the States and they can't get Crisco anywhere. So they actually do come in to buy it for baking. Oh. <laughs> we're, we're one of the only places you can get it in the, around the are you city. Are you saying it's not available in Australia? Is that what you you're can't saying? get it in a Woolworths or a Safeways here. No, you, you, you don't have oh. it in supermarkets. There's nothing um, comparable? or. I don't know. Uh, not really, no. Wild. <laughs> Wild. Nothing comparable to putting a hand up somebody's butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where would you like to see Eagle Leathers in about, let's say, five to ten years? Eagle Leather, like I'd like to see us as, you know, still doing what we're doing but on a bigger scale. Um, helping more, more community events. Uh, like with Fantastic, we run an event called Fantastic, which is held at Club 80, which is traditionally a sex on site premises. Um, and it's normally male only, but once or twice a year, they open it up for all genders and sexualities. Mm. And we originally had it just once a year and we had got such good support from it and, and we, that we ended up, you know, started growing then we started you know, our customers started supporting us more and more because we're putting this event on mm. so we're like okay let's get them international djs you know and let's get our community international performers and djs so we it grew and we so we started growing fantastic to the point where you know you have two international djs and performers because we wanted to make the community to feel that they were actually part of the building of this, you know, and to know that that Eagle Lever can be almost interactive for the for the for the community, 
Uh, and so we started putting on Fantastic as well, um, for right. twice a year. And I would like, I'd like to, for customers to, you know, I, I would like to, for customers to feel like they're part of our family. You know, I want to be more than a business. That that's basically yeah. what it what it is. Yeah. Um, and I want to have memories. Like I feel like when you get to the end, uh, and when you're you know, you know, hopefully I won't be in a home one day, but like, <laughs> but I, I think all you've got is your memories and, and I want them to be really fond memories. I want to be able to look back and feel like we did something. Is there anything as manager that you won't permit the shop to do for someone? Won't permit to the shop to do for For example, someone. What's, if someone came in with some kind of very extreme requests or something, if it was, are, yeah. are there limitations to what you will or won't do? Of course, do? If, if I feel like it's, it's going to be dangerous to, okay. to, to them, you know, if okay. I, I, would pro, I would try to guide them in the, in the right direction and let them know that there's, um, some, there's a lot of complications and, and, and hazards for what they're doing. And um, I would definitely try to guide them. And we, we, we do run, we don't run as many classes as we used to, but a big part of that was we, we would guide them towards a class so they could learn more and how to do things safely. Um, you know, we've had people using knitting needles for sounds and things like that. Um, we've had people who have um, been, you know, putting electro play toys above the waist onto their nipples with, with devices that aren't safe for, for above the waist. Uh, we've had people doing some pretty dangerous stuff and we've just had to actually say, you know, this is dangerous what you're doing. Um, not only for their own well-being but for the community's well-being mm -hmm. because the, we don't need any bad stories for our community and it, it yeah. doesn't shine a good light um people have passed away you know from 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 doing stupid stuff all around the world you know and we want to prevent that and we want to educate and that, that's a big part of our philosophy is education and uh, we are really are a store for the converted if you just are interested in starting out um, and you want a glittery dildo? We're not your store for that. <laughs> <laughs> we're not a part, We're not a store for hens parties or bucks parties. Uh, um, you know, we have some people wanting novelty things, and we're not that kind of store. You know, what's the kinkiest um, request you've accommodated? Hmm, well, that's a, that's a good one. Just not looking around the room. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, I, Probably wouldn't say. <laughs> Come on. You've got an audience, you've got cameras. Tell us, tell us. Oh, <laughs> I just don't want to, yeah, for the customers. You don't, have, you don't have to identify anyone. <laughs> Um, we've, we've done things where we've, we've, we've added into role play and things like that, you know. Um, but yeah, we, we've we've kind of stopped that because then it becomes expected a little bit a little bit oh, too much, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've helped with an uh, yeah yeah we kind of helped with an abduction scenario once upon a time as well and things and yeah <laughs> yeah. But. Is is there anything you wish you could redo in your kink journey? Anything you you would rather do differently I've, if you could do it again? It's a really good question. Um, I, not really, mm. not really. To, to be honest, like I've, you know, there's some things, I, I guess that my, one of the things that I've been prone to, which has sometimes been great and sometimes also been a bit of negative, sometimes I've overdone things too much. <laughs> Such as? <laughs> like, you know, like, I probably overexposed myself at times to things, you know, like, and like, I, I wouldn't say it's something I regret because you, you've got no, no choice. But so the very first time I bought a, f a flogger, um, I, I, got it, I got it home and I laid it on my bed and I couldn't stop looking at it. Like it was like this really, really uh, mystical kind of object and the BDSM community to me was like this like it seemed like such another world and so fascinating and 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 it still is so incredibly fascinating but sometimes one of the one of the downfalls of doing I guess what what I what I do um is that for 15 years you I love floggers and now sometimes I look at them sometimes as a product oh. and that that's yeah and it, it, you kind of lose mm -hmm. that impact 
So what I sometimes do is I take, I try and go back in my head and, and, and appreciate it a little bit more. And that's, that's, that's kind of more of a challenge mm. um, is, to make, is to actually bring back, because I love taboo. You know, I love things that make me feel like it's taboo anyway. Oh, okay. And the first time I received the whip, it felt taboo and felt naughty. And the first time I did it, you know, in a lot of, a lot of these things, like, you know, when you had that feeling in your, the butterflies in your stomach when you're doing something yeah. that, that feels taboo. It, um, like I've, I've probably, you know, uh, overexposed sometimes to some things. However, you know, I've got no regrets. Like I really yeah. don't, you know, like, uh, yeah. And I just think it's, it's sometimes you've just got to go on to the next thing and, it, and it's just a challenge to go on to and try to find something new and find something, you know, always moving on, I guess. What's the biggest misconception about you? Well, the, the probably <laughs> or the biggest misconception is that people presume that straight away, first of all, they presume that I'm, I'm straight out gay male. And then if, if, if the, when they, when they realize that I'm not, they normally go, oh, you're straight. And mm. for some reason, when people say, oh, you're straight, it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Um, just because like, I, that's definitely, I don't want to be ever perceived to be that way. Um, it's probably the way that a lot of people want me to, to straight out identify. Um, and it's almost like, you know, announce yourself, <laughs> pick, pick, pick a side. Um, and, but the thing is, unfortunately, we live in a world where, where people have had to say we're gay. Yeah. You know what I mean? We've had to, and then people have had to say, I am this sexuality, this is, this is who I am, because we've had fascism, you know, we've had, there's been so many challenges for people who are, who, you know, are of different orientations. Um, so we've had to say those things, but wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world where we could just say that we're sexual beings? Yeah. You know, you I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gay. I'm not heterosexual. I'm a sexual being, you know, and, and I've maybe the year, I don't know, 2050, who knows, <laughs> but that would be, that would be great. And so it's, yeah, I guess that's a misconception. That's, that could be one of the misconceptions I'd say. Yeah. BJ of Eagle Leathers in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you for being part of Inside Leather History at Fireside Chats. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>